Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to our second Bodhi panel of today. And I hope you're all doing well, uh, even in these like turbulent and unpredictable times. We do think it's super, super important that we get together and talk about important issues like our planet and also cherish each other uh, and um, the stuff that we work with that we love so much. So. I am, uh, my name is Diana, and I work for a company called Inner Voice Artists and uh, a, com uh, a nonprofit organization called Youth Mondes. And together with Eco Shaker, we have arranged this panel uh, now, and we also will be arranging several other panels in the future. What I can say about the World Ocean Day Italy is that it's an uh, educational space that wants to bring Italian companies, international companies, and European companies that work together uh, to, to make our ocean a healthier place. So it's businesses, it's NGOs, it's different schools, it's national parks, different youth leaders, artists, and pretty much everyone who wants to get involved in, in issues that uh, are good for our oceans. We want to support, we want to educate, and we also want to highlight the sustainable business practices so that we can uh, um, make our ocean a better place and also this planet. So we, Bodhi wants to act as a bridge between Italian coastal communities and also private sector. And we also want to uh, get together all different countries uh, in Southern Europe. So since Italy is kind of in the center, it does make sense to make it there. This year, unfortunately, we weren't able to, to be there in person, but hopefully we can do it next year. We are still extremely, extremely happy to have uh, organized this online panel. And with that, I'm going to give the word to our amazing little moderator, Lily Platt. She's only 12 years old. Hello. And uh, hello, Lily. <laughs> And she will be introducing our panelists. So, Lily, the screen is all yours. Hi, everyone. My name is Lily, and I am a proud ambassador for Wodi. And I'm so excited to be telling you that we are joined by these two amazing, powerful environmentalists from two corners of the globe. And I, and I would like to first introduce you to Jackie from The Last Straw, and we are both members of the Plastic Pollution Coalition. And I would also like to introduce, you, introduce to you Pia from Passion for Ocean, who I met at the, who I met at the Plastic Quail Conference. And I'm so happy that I can call, that I can call these powerhouses for, uh, for the planet my friends. And my first question for both of you is what was sort of your light bulb moment or the moment that you decided to stand up for the ocean or the moment that you decided that you wanted to do something for the planet? Pia, you can go first, Becky. No. <laughs> you go, you go. Oh, I hate this question because I don't really know. Thing is, I, I think I've been I've been a marine biologist for forever, so that, that's my um job in all this being uh, the, the voice of the ocean or the voice of the barnacles and the neuterbranks and all that and that's always been part of me and i have absolutely no idea at what point i decided to step up because it's always been there so sorry that's a boring answer but <laughs> well for for me um i started off i i've always been around the water and all my jobs have been uh, i used to be a river guide and then became a kayak guide and just outside showing people around into these, you know, these beautiful spaces. But um, if any of you traveled anywhere in the last 10 years, you see exponentially how much plastic pollution we're seeing everywhere. And so for me, um, my light bulb moment, my my moment where I really decided to do more, I, I call myself that I went from a slacktivist to an activist. Um, you know, I voted, but I barely voted. I was always outdoors doing everything. I really felt that, um, you know, the fact that we politicize uh, the environment. It's not a political issue. We have the right to clean air, water, and soil. And um, I really just did not want to participate in a system that just perpetuates all of this um, pollution and rewarding, you know, industry to continue to uh, to do so. But, and I felt they weren't speaking to me. Um, but with that said, I got to a point where I was on a, a trip. I know exactly when it was, even though me complaining about it and doing my part just individually, I was volunteering for beach cleanups and everything. 
but I knew it was just surface. And it was when I did a trip in Belize and we were out at the Glover, Glover's Atoll, which is a world heritage site. They don't even fish there, it's all protected. We, it's the most amazing coral I've seen and just big living fish. I mean, I, I grew up part of my life in Puerto Rico and a lot of those fish they see when they get out because they're used to being hunted or you know, that's really, really fished out. But this was incredible. Huge groupers coming up to you and just like hanging out and, um, Anyway, so we were we were literally on these huts in in the water, uh, sleeping there. And one night, a, a storm came through, and we thought our hut was going to get blown in the water. I mean, the the doors kept flying open. We're holding it. There's you know water coming in everywhere, thunder, lightning, wind, waves coming up through the floorboards. And the next day, we went out, and we were out there, 45 kilometers off the coast of Belize, and a river trash came by us, and most of it was plastic pollution. And so what had happened is the night before all of the mainland that it all, you know, came out through the waterways and the, the watershed into the ocean and it got into the current and came out there. And I came back to Santa Cruz. We, I live in a beautiful place right above the Monterey Bay Marine Sanctuary. And one of the things I did is with the beach cleanups is trained to be a sanctuary steward. So I learned a lot about the problem with this training, but I also owed them 50 hours of uh, volunteer time to lead beach cleanups and everything. But I was really uh, I wanted to stop it at the tap and I didn't know how I was really overwhelmed by the problem. Um, and I really wanted to, to get, I was going, I was going to talk people were talking about, uh, the, the scientists were getting a lot of data from the oceans and from gyres at that point, it was 10 years ago. And they kept saying like, we're getting all this data out, but nobody's changing their ways. And, um, and there was also like the oceanic society were taking like these big C CEOs and stuff out into the Pacific garbage patch and showing them, you know, Unilever, look at, you know, this and that, but still was no real changes happen. So I really wanted to, to do something for behavior change, but and it was until I got served a glass of water with a plastic straw in it that I did not ask for. I was already aware of that and asking for no straw, um, but I wasn't expecting it to come in my glass of water. And when that happened, that was it. That was my last plastic straw moment. And I thought, that's it. If the least I can do is get restaurants to write straws upon request on their menu, um, at the time, we had a, um, a program, actually it was mandated by the state because we had a drought um, to only serve water upon request. And I thought that's it because I used to, I, a lot of my travel bug, I, I supplemented and financed by waitressing and bartending. And so I knew that the, the don't ask would, was a big one, that if you just didn't put it in there, that most people wouldn't ask for it. And it, was, it turned, to be, turned out to be true. And it did become kind of a behavior change thing. It was literally in front of our noses and no one was thinking about it. Even my friends doing beach cleanups, we go out after for, you know, a bite to eat and everyone's sucking on straws. I'm like, did you not just see what we picked up? And they're like, oh, I see the, I saw the reactions. And I even saw the reactions with, with restaurants. Um, if I got them to serve straws upon request, they saw how little they were giving out and then they started changing things. I mean, I really thought, I really believe that people don't set out to pollute the planet. They're just not aware. And that's how it started. And that was my light bulb moment. And just, I, I call myself a late bloomer. I, I feel like I'm just finally participating in the system. And, and here I am uh, writing policy now for someone who really hates politics. Um, I know that businesses won't self-regulate and we need to have those regulations. We need to make the rules so everyone plays fair. That was, that was a very fine story. That was very good. Um, and you can really see how blinded some people are about 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 plastic and how and how we just our, and how it's just used almost every single day and how we don't even notice how dangerous it was and that was very interesting. and Thank my you, second question is what was your proudest moment as an activist and environmentalist sort of what was your um proudest or one of your favorite moments You want me to go first here again? <laughs> it's that is a difficult question because um, I've had so many amazing moments. Now I've, I've got the pleasure to share the stage with Fabian Cousteau uh, and just uh, a couple of weeks ago I actually also shared the stage, like the digital stage with Sylvia Earle, which was a big plot. But I have to say one of the coolest moments are some of the coolest moments are the ones where you see that you can see the change in people's eyes. Now, uh, we, we do a lot of, uh, also our take on this whole issue is to fill in 
the why. You know, you have the what is the problem and you have the what or just how to fix it. And we work on the why segment, that inner motivation. So we try to just create this fun, exciting curiosity space where we introduce people to the ocean in just a positive way because there's so many great people talking about the problems and solutions, but there's so few talking about nudibranchs and polychaetes and seaweed and all the stuff that we're actually trying to save. So a lot of people are talking about how much money we can make, blah, 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 and we just really want to be the voice of uh, the barnacles. Um, so I just vividly remember us going actually on a beach cleanup. We have something called Before the Birds Arrive that we clean up bird reservoir reserves, not reservoirs, um, before the birds arrive. Uh, and there was these two, two little boys who just, we found an eel! And they had found this massive polychaete, free swimming polychaete. And I was like, that's a polychaete. And it's so cool. It's an like, ocean cousin of the earthworm. And they were like, whoa, I have no idea what that means. And we were just go talking. And I told them about how this polychaete is digging into the soil and, you know, oxygenating it and acting as sort of like a janitor of the ocean. And it was really big, and I haven't seen that species in that part of Norway and before. So I was just, I forgot that I was an ad adult. And I turned into this 10 year old again, which is like, oh, this is awesome. And you can see the kids are like, oh, so cool, so cool, so cool. And you can hear them for the next hour. You could hear this, Polychaete, Polychaete, Polychaete. <laughs> they just play with this poor thing. And I, I don't think it survived. <laughs> which is kind of sad, but these two kids were just like, they would not shut up about the earthworms of the ocean and how important they were and how we shouldn't throw cigarette butts in the ocean because they get confused and then they don't know how to, you know, behave and stuff like that. So those are the kinds of moments that I remember best because you can see that you triggered something in those little kids and that hopefully they will grow up to be scientists or just conservationists and they will love the ocean in a different way. That's such a great story. I, I love those moments. And actually, when you, you talk about the proudest moments, Lily, I, it, it, they've always been with kids. Um, and to see that uh, enthusiasm, I mean, kids get it, right? If you tell a kid that this is a this is a turtle, what does a turtle eat? Jellyfish, this is a plastic bag. What does it look like in the water? Jellyfish. End of story, they bring their own bag. There's no more explaining to do. And I always tell that story because it's, it really is that simple. And, and kids get it. You know, we've been... I call this, when I speak to kids, I say, this is a bad habit that we've been marketed to and told it's convenient, but there's nothing convenient about single use plastic. So, you know, in, in my talks, what really inspires me is to just see the kids just light up. And I want to really inspire them to um, really look at the issue and be creative with their own like superpower, really. If they, if they like to do art, if they like to write, if they like science, like go for it, we need it all. And I tell people, tell the kids all the time that, that you know, plastic, and especially single use plastic, is a design flaw, and you can redesign your future. Um, one of my, my proudest moments was there was a group of kids in uh, Berkeley. Um, it's a third grade class that they're a zero waste classroom, and you know they really learn about the subject, and they can they can have the trash for the whole year in one jar, and they're super proud of themselves. They have their own utensils, and I, I go and speak to them every year. Um, but just planting that seed and just seeing what they did. And they were really instrumental in one of the most comprehensive ordinances around in Berkeley ordinance um, that really talks about more along the lines of, uh, you know, reusables and everything. So they're really piloting some of the reusable programs and stuff. But these kids are even, they haven't stopped there. They're out there. Uh, the Ecology Center had them with clipboards asking uh, people before the shutdown, before everybody had to go home. But uh, asking people, what do you feel about this? Is this easy? Is this hard? And the kids are really into it. Another group of kids in Alameda, but even before Berkeley kids, I went and spoke to them before the turtle, you know, before the whole straw thing blew up and the turtle video went viral. I spoke to them and just planted that seed mm -hmm. about plastic straws. And they they did audits in their in their um, lunchroom and on the trash and in their, in their uh, playgrounds. Mm -hmm. And they went to the uh, you know, the people buying the stuff for the cafeteria, the whole school district, they had changed, but they didn't stop there. They went to the town and they got everything changed. And and that was just amazing to me. And so I do feel like I just plant little seeds, Jackie plants a seed and the kids really take it to a whole nother level. So I'm very proud. 
Can I just add to that? Because yeah. I think that's so, such an important aspect of letting everybody know that everybody is sort of invited. So I do a lot of talks for uh, especially high school kids who are, you know, mm -hmm. deciding what to do for the rest of their lives. Um, and mostly people are like, do you have to be a marine biologist to work with the ocean? No, you don't have to do no. that. We need engineers. We need plumbers. We need mechanics. We need we need everybody on board for this one. So do whatever you want uh, as long as you have fun. And yeah. that is also so nice to see the kids who are like, yes, I'm going to have so much fun doing, building stuff and yeah. <laughs> <the earth." laughs> Exactly. Yes because, yes, because education at school, if you, want, if you want children to care about the planet and for the ocean, because if you teach children at a young age or at day one, and then you can actually build a generation that cares for the environment instead of destroys it. So I think that that was just a very, an, a very amazing answer. And what was your inspiration? Was there a person in your life that really inspired you to have a passion for the ocean? Was there sort of a certain individual that that did that oh, for, for me um i think inspiring for the ocean was just working with my friend uh kim powell uh, she is the owner of blue water ventures that's who i do uh, kayaking with and uh she really did open my eyes beyond just my own love for the ocean to just all the little intricacies i mean when we take groups out to the Virgin Islands and we go sailing like I've, I've sailed through there when I lived in Puerto Rico and you know I can identify a lot of fish just from seeing them but then she's you know you hear her she's it's just infectious and I'm sure Pia is the same way but you can hear her in the snorkel whoa, 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 you know like you, you know, I, I'm out of pass by that fish and see oh that's a sergeant major but then she's looking at the behavior like no that's the dad he's protecting the da, da, you know and she's just watching this whole thing or she like she'll see uh like debris, you know, just sitting there and she just starts to stops and looks and looks and then she knows there's going to be an octopus there because it's like kind of this little uh, debris field there. And so she just really opens our eyes. So everyone turns into these fish geeks by the end. Um, I'm really everything. I mean, she's really into nudibranchs as well and all these polychaetes. And so she's just looking at the thing. So that, I mean, she's really been an inspiration, especially for the for marine biology in, in going out there and just really taking the time to look and, and watch and, and exhibit the, just see the behaviors has just been amazing. And then the other one that's really inspired me in the conservation end and uh, messaging and just, um, you know, really stepping up and doing what I do is Wallace J. Nichols, the author of Blue Minds. He's a marine biologist, a turtle biologist, and, uh, you know, really invoking that you protect what you love and having some of that, that language um, that does permeate throughout my 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 project. I you know I don't want to make anyone feel bad or be fearful or whatever. I just really want them to embrace and love love and protect not only the ocean but you know any waterway and and uh, and the environment. Yeah, I've had those uh, same um, people. I'm just gonna mute. Okay, thank you. <laughs> there was an echo. Here. Uh, I grew up with David Attenborough he was like my guiding shining star and i hope somebody will invent this live forever potion to give to him because he is just an international galactic treasure um he has inspired so many people me including to do things and i had no idea everybody around me seemed to know that i was going to be a marine biologist since from before i even knew it myself when i was five i wanted to be a dinosaur when i was seven i wanted to be an astronaut started high school, I wanted to be a pilot and, you know, but these things, they really just apparently was part of my soul. And David Attenborough sort of guided me towards that goal, but it was my high school biology teacher combined with this guy called Peter Beckman uh, at the history, uh, the natural museum, um, natural history museum, sorry, English is my second language. So things I get confused. And they sort of kind of like bumped me into biology. Um, and then I, when I came to the university, a few of my professors were just so ridiculously inspiring. They were just jumping around. We had this guy who, he was 60 something and he would jump from the podium over down to a donkey skeleton, just like, look at this, it is so cool. <laughs> we were just like, wow. And so these, these people are the ones that just really 
not only inspired to, you know, getting into biology, but also being enthusiastic about it. So I think science today has failed humanity in the sense that we have not been able to translate our findings into something that is actually understandable to a normal person. And I could tell from a lot of the professors and a lot of the scientists at the IMR stuff like that, they make their articles and their journals for other scientists. So they sort of do sport in making it more complicated. And then you have a few of them who understood that in order for this to have any, you know, be useful at all, we need to make it available for people out there. So those scientists, to all you scientists out there who have understood this, you are my heroes. We need to translate the stuff <laughs> because now we have anti-vaxxers and flat earthers and climate skeptics and people who think you get COVID from 5G polls because science has not been able to translate it. So yeah, those are my guiding stars and my heroes. Can I just add to that as someone who, I've never been diagnosed, but I've been told by my family and friends that I'm dyslexic and I've always had trouble learning like from books and in school and really kind of understanding um, some of the concepts. Uh, but I did thrive in biology because I could see. I could see, I was hands-on, I was tactile, we were dissecting. I, I draw, so I could draw and, and, and communicate it. But really it's the hands-on experience where it really, um, it, it does stick with me. So it's really important to the scientists, I, I think, or teachers in general to just kind of immerse uh, kids mm -hmm. into the, their fields and have and translate that infectious um, just love for the subject. It really does. It's it's infectious, you catch it, and then you want to learn more. That is it's true because I, because I remember, as long as I can remember, I just always glued my eyes to the to the TV whenever I, whenever I heard the David Attenborough documentary was on the television, and he was actually the reason why I became very fascinated by fossils and many other um, species that people didn't really think of because at school people thought this was quite weird, but I always found a fascination for uh, for animals that people always called quote unquote ugly. I really liked blobfishes and like loads of different species of monkeys that so that so david attenborough was also definitely my my inspiration can i just add to that sorry to just, because i'm the same way i found my favorite fish when i was nine in the library i think at my school in some weird book i found this thing called the gulper eel or the pelican eel which yeah. just looks like a big sperm cell uh, just mass, like a sperm cell has uh, mm -hmm. made a love baby with Pac-Man and it has a long skinny tail that flies mm -hmm. in it. but it's so weird and everybody's like that, that is ugly but it's not it's just different and weird and I think like I love science science fiction and fantasy and I think that's why I love the ocean as much because it's so much weird stuff yeah and so much fun <laughs> So I love the blobfish and all the ugly stuff. Awesome. And my next question is, as leading female environment, do you have tips for girls and women in the environmental field? I think something happened to the internet connection. Did, can you repeat the question? Oh. Oh, sorry about that. Uh, well, what my question was, was as leading female environmentalists, do you have tips for girls and women in the environmental field? Be cool. Stand up for yourself. Stand up for other girls because there's a lot of... I'm not going to point fingers, but men, <laughs> especially white men pushing 50. We have this expression in Norway that just white males pushing 50 is this horrible demographic <laughs> segment that will just talk down to you. You have the little girl and you have the little girl talk. This little, I'm gonna explain something to you. And when whenever somebody tries to explain something to you, just, yeah. And own the people with knowledge. Never get angry. Get, mm -hmm. you know, do, challenge them or fight them, but fight them with knowledge. Yeah and facts instead of you know getting angry and yeah. if you know how learn how to do that please let me know because i still haven't figured that one out yet but i would just like say 
believe in yourself and do whatever you want to do, as long as it doesn't hurt people, of course, or animals, but, you know, follow your dreams, have fun with it, and do not be afraid of dressing down. I mean, going to conferences as a young girl uh, is, you will be, oh, what is it, world patronized? Is that the correct term for that one? You'll be sort of there's a lot of people who would feel like they would just, you know, going to explain to you how the world is working and yeah. just yeah. don't mind people. I took a lot of time to just learn how to ignore mm. angry people. And one more thing is that actually grown-ups have no clue what they're doing. This has taken me so many years to learn. I always thought that grown-ups knew what they were doing. Politicians knew what they were doing. Nope. I'm a grown-up myself no clue nobody around me has any clue what they're doing everybody's just kind of going with it and hoping that it's going to be okay so don't trust anyone no just trust i don't know yeah <laughs> so. that's great well yeah as a female environmentalist and also someone who's um my, my parents are Cuban, so I'm first generation Cuban in the United States. Um, I am white passing, so I mean, we're pretty white, pretty, uh, the, the family goes back to Spain. So I don't get that um, discrimination so much when people see me, but I do feel I, I get some of that with my long, I actually, my whole last name is Jacqueline Nunez de Villavicencio. It's a very long Spanish name. I don't have a middle name, it's so long. Um, so for official paperwork and stuff, people see that and go, what the hell? And, um, but anyways, I did, I, I do experience that too, Pia, in, in this realm. A lot of times I feel like I didn't have a voice. Um, I was always the one, you know, with the plastic straw and, and even my own colleagues now, they were just poo-pooing me and not really understanding. And because I wasn't a scientist, I didn't come from this. I was just, you know, this, this crazy activist coming on, but I could see it. And it really had to, it was shocking to me that I really had to, and a lot of them were men, convinced them that this was something that, you know, anyone can get around. I know that at the time people were really going after bags, going after polystyrene, all those things are important, but they weren't getting any movement. And I knew that the, the plastic straw would be the gateway issue, right? But I felt like I was talking to deaf ears and a lot of it were these, like you said, that demographic of, of men saying, you know, little lady. Another thing to to flag as, as far as environmentalists goes, when, when you're in a panel or you're, <laughs> talking when, when it's, it's usually a, you know, an older white scientist, I'm sorry to say, um, male, uh, when they start off uh, saying all of their credentials um, and, you know, doctor, blah, 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 and I've done this and I've done that, that, that's a flag to me. You know, they're about to say, they're about to go into some other thing. I mean, we, we sat through a panel where this one guy, he was, it was all about sea mining. But he talked about all his history of being a conservationist and, and environmentalist and stuff. And there was this young woman part of the panel. And he even made a point to say to her, you know, I was basically, you weren't even born yet, you know, like just really derogatory. But when it came to be her turn to talk, she just put him, I mean, all the things he said she just had, she was on it. You could see her taking notes. She was a scientist. She was young. And it was friggin' amazing. And I was so proud, um, uh, you know, for her and for us. Um, another thing I want to mention is I just got chosen to be part of a, a group of women that are going, it's, it's an ex expedition, these women that are going around the world. And I'm on, yeah, so they've picked 300 women from uh, a, a group of 10,000. Pia, you should go, you should apply, you would be in it in a I second. I know girls has gone on that expedition. I yeah, yeah. It's amazing. I am the worst marine biologist in the world because I get seasick. So well, I'm, <laughs> I'm sure I'm going to get seasick too. When I see everybody that's been on, they've done eight legs already. They started in October. Uh, they're, the boat's now in Tahiti. They had to um, uh, stall everything for 12 months because of COVID and everything. And so we're starting up again in uh, April. I was supposed to be in uh, August of this year in Darwin to Perth a section of it. And there's marine biologists there, there's artists, there's all these activists. But yeah, it's funny Pia, because a lot of the the <laughs> the uh, stories that I'm hearing about these women bonding, a lot of it's like bonding over holding up hair while people are puking. Um, <laughs> but they get over that. Like I, I do too, I'm worried about that. But uh, cause everything's out at sea and you're you're taking these um, these samples. But I'm really excited about that. And they get questions all the time. Why is it all women? 
And they said, because oh. we don't get a lot of women that have these opportunities in this field of science and everything. And, and to get, and these women are incredible. I went to the summit and got to meet a lot of them. And I was just amazed that they even chose me to be part of this amazing group because they, they were rock stars in their field. I mean, it was, it's really inspiring. And I feel like it's a, we've got this super team of women working towards this um, multidisciplinary um, subject and, and, uh, and problem. And it's really exciting. So what we've done is we've got a year of um, virtual impact and we, and they just launched a, a shift platform, uh, which last last straw is part of, but you can get on there. I think it's shift dot how I can give you guys the link, but you can get on there and had it wherever, you know, any aspect of, of the plastic pollution problem, there's different ways because they're realizing with all the data they're getting out at sea that it all starts from land. And uh, so I'm really excited about that. And I'm going to be meeting all these rock star scientists. And Pia, I would love to have it be awesome to be on a boat with you and go out and see it. And I think you would love it. These women I will fill your head with answers to questions you didn't know you had. Exactly. Expertise. <laughs> right? But it's so fun because Christine, one of the girls who were on this uh, from the, the Easter Island, is one of my best friends. And I've been following with the, the drone. This, uh, yeah, the drone? yeah, no, that, no, that's Christine. That's another one of my bad, good, real good friends. <laughs> yeah, well, she's, well. yeah, uh, Spitten, she's going to yeah. be my my mission lead. She's uh, our lead person, and we're going to get to play with that her underwater drone. Yes, she's an Christine, amazing person. But Christine Berg, Berg, she's from uh, Palma. Yeah, yeah. No, I met them both. I love them. They're awesome. They're great people. You're going to have so much fun. I mean, yeah, yeah. I'm going to go with you. I'm I'm on a sort of like I'm on a burnout. Right now, I've yeah, yeah. been struggling with a really bad burnout for two years. But once this goes away, I will be on the expedition. Well, it got delayed, so you should apply. Yeah. <laughs> for the later part of it, actually, which is later on, like in, I think, 2022 now, there's a lot of um, openings, and you should you'd be a shoe in. I'm going to do that. And I really just wanted to say one more thing about yeah. women in conservation work thing, because you said something that made me think about this thing that I, um, somebody told me. Um, or, I mean, it makes sense. So not to be, um, make, what is it called? Not to demotivate people, but us girls, we need to be patients. As Jackie said, you spend a lot of time convincing the other part about stuff. So you usually have to take a little bit of time, a couple of minutes to convince them that you're a human being. And then you have to convince them that you actually know what you're talking about. And then you can start doing your job. Now, most boys don't have to do that. So you will at a lot of times see boys being more efficient. But that is solely due to this. Not because they're better. It's just that we have a lot more things to kind of work through to get there but we're working on it and there's a lot of after i mean after me too a lot of attitudes changed i think there was a lot of people both boys and girls who realized that we are kind of yeah we're not making everybody equal here so just keep on being badass that's kind of my biggest <laughs> So we should always just see that that we should never hear the word no because we have the power. Because <laughs> everyone has the power. Um, because plastics is a worldwide problem, what are your ways of inspiring change to people? Me? Okay. <laughs> Um, yeah, so for me, it's uh, a lot of what I do. I think it's really important to kind of walk the talk and um, start where you are. And I feel I felt that a lot of the change that I enacted in my own community um, was just through me. And I found this too, even with everything that I've done, um, river guiding to being on a volleyball team. Um, I've been on teams that have been like undefeated in, in volleyball. And it was really kind of stepping up and uh, taking responsibility for yourself and doing those actions. And then they, they, it, it, it moves out. I'm, I'm not naturally a leader, nor do I seek that out. I end up just being um, pushed into those leadership roles. And I think it's because when I make a decision about something, I just am um, focused and and I, I know it needs to be done and I just start doing it and then it and then people start to to see that. Um so yeah I think that that's one of the, the biggest things that like for me that I think is really important. Walk the talk. 
Yeah. I absolutely agree. And I, I'm, I'm the same way. Um, I never really asked for any leadership roles. They just kind of happened because I probably because I'm the loudest in the gang most of the time. So I will just talk. And when I get nervous, I talk even more. So that just happens to just fall into that. But just doing stuff. I mean, not just talking about it, but actually doing like putting some action behind the words. So one of my biggest pet peeves about today is that we talk and 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 we talk. I have been to a trillion conferences and seminars and workshops and blah 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 and they have the same speakers talking about the same issues to the same audience again and again and again and again and again and again there's never anything new and they are so unbelievably boring and you have so many politicians just talking i don't know how many years have we been having these like these summits where they're talking about setting emission goals, blah, blah, blah. Nothing is happening. Some countries actually manage to do it, but some other, I'm not pointing fingers, but I'm living one of them. Just talk about it. Nothing's happening. And we do have the resources. We do have the knowledge. We, I think we have everything we need to fix the problems, but we're not, you know, hmm. walking. The talk. And I would also just want to say again that don't, don't um, don't feel ashamed about not being perfect. I think that's one of the biggest um, messages I really want to get out there that not everybody, I love Greta Thunberg. She just sets an awesome example, but not everybody has the, the capacity to do it that, you know, do everything right. And so we just need not, I mean, you can't just, uh, how should I put this? Don't hide behind, oh, well, I went on a beach cleaning, so now I can, you know, take a vacation to Italy or whatever. But you have to take big baby steps. But you don't expect to change your entire life like that. You have to, you know, do it gradually because we are, human beings are smart and ridiculously stupid at the same time. And we are not really good at big changes unless it's you know the politician did kind of just force us to do it so yeah. yeah walk the talk but in small big steps if that makes any sense <laughs> yeah pia you just reminded me one of the things that we talked about i was just on another panel watching another panel with some of our youth ambassadors and one of the things that that one of the questions that the, the last question they asked them how do you make plastics uncool and um you know lily you were on that panel and you guys all had these different answers but one of the things that you know they've always said is that we don't need everyone doing things perfectly we need a lot of people doing things imperfectly and i think one of the the big things about the last plastic straw and why it it stuck or why it was so successful is that there's actually a field of study behind it about little habits lead to big habits mm -hmm. and you have to start down and and you have to like clean your own house before you can clean anyone else's so mm -hmm. one of the things i've been actually ruminating and actually this is the first time i'm going to say it to yeah. the public and live and i hope that people embrace this but there's a lot of concepts right now, people talking about living sustainably and mm -hmm. zero waste. Um, sustainably, that kind of sometimes throws me because I'm like, what's sustainable? What are you sustaining? I want it to be more resilient. I want it to be, when you talk about science, I want it to be regenerative. I'm, I have a degree in horticulture and there's a lot of regenerative horticulture. I mean, all what we do is building soil and the, the and actually the, the byproducts is what you grow but it's all about maintaining that life of the soil mm -hmm. and a lot of that when i learned about uh soil biology especially a lot of that translated when i learned about marine biology the ph all that stuff you know for life needs to be the same so my thing is why don't we talk about being more resilient how do we come out of covid how do we come out when we really try to get these messages together um you know there's a great there's a great young panelist um her name was jessica jen jen outer She's a youth ambassador for the Global Alliance for the Rights of Nature. And I think bringing all of these things together when you talk about environmental racism and, and, and you know, in, in everything that's going on, they, they're talking about it's also environmental colonialism. Pollution is environmental colonialism. And bringing all these conversations together because it's all interconnected. And um, so speaking of that, one of the things I want to say instead of, I think when you say zero waste, that's unattainable. No one could be zero waste, even though there's no waste mm -hmm. in nature. So we want to, you know, emulate nature um, and go towards it. And I love biomimicry and, and design. But what about saying zero wasteful? I want to be hashtag zero wasteful. So 
I aim to be, you know, whether it's turning off the light bulb, I mean, it could be, you can embrace it in anything that you're uh, about. Haley Thomas is all about veganism and, and Hannah Testa, you know, you can make that um, with food waste or with everything you want to be, why don't we strive towards being not so wasteful? A lot of the problems is because we are being very wasteful with our resources, you know, doing all these things. So I would like to work towards being hashtag zero wasteful and I'm not trendy and I'm not a young, you know, uh, activists, but I would love to to do that with our youth ambassadors and to really kind of trend that that aspect and anyone can take it on and make it their own and what that means to them. Can I please add to that? Sorry, Lily, but I just really, and if it's a weird sound, it's just my computer going nuts. I think it got so excited about this one because I've also hated, I'm, I've started to hate now the word sustainable. Because again, what is sustainable? Everybody can say, well, we're, we have a sustainable a sustainability leader in blah, blah, blah. But that just means that usually they just slap one of the sustainability goals on their web pages and say, well, we are aiming to do this and this and this, but they never say what they're actually doing. Now, I love to talk from um, Amon Diva, Diva Amon, uh, during the Our Ocean Conference, and she just constantly said responsible, responsible fisheries, responsible actions instead of sustainable, because that's what we need to do. We need to be responsible about what we're doing and skip that whole sustainability thing. And one of the things you also talked about now was the, the true nature of circular economy. So I work with a lot of sustainability people and a lot of them are talking big words with about circular economy but a lot of them when you talk about like when you go down into depth into things it's usually just you know recycling plastic in the right bag that's their like vision of circular economy and they they don't really grasp that whole thing that there's nothing waste in nature there's no waste in nature it's just resources being moved from one place to another so Oh, I, I love that. Yeah, thank you. Sorry, Lila, I'm going to give you a No, it's okay. Thank you very much for that answer. That was very good. And because everyone is in is in lockdown now, and there are a lot more takeaways because people because people can't really go to restaurants, and lots of restaurants do have lots of single use plastic. So how do you think um, you could? Uh, how do you think people could still refuse single use plastic even though the, they are stuck at home? Jackie, you can start with this one if you would like. Yeah, thank you. Uh, we're actually, this is a big discussion right now as restaurants are reopening and some of the CDC guidelines, there's a lot of confusion with the restaurants even mm. themselves and reopening, but there's a lot of confusion for us. Uh, and and we, it started off with the, the whole plastic bag thing going to the, we've had all these plastic bag bans. A lot of them got either uh, stalled out or reversed, um, you know, these these knee jerk um, reactions by some of our, our uh people of power. Um, but it wasn't based on science. You know, actually, the science says that this the COVID lasts longest, the, the COVID virus lasts longest on plastic. And um, so it made no sense. But the plastics industry really jumped on that and took advantage of this, this moment to really exploit. So unfortunately, there's a lot of these CDC guidelines that in, incorporate you opening up your restaurant, even though you're dining in to do single use disposable plastic. And some of them are even spelling it out. And we've got letters going out. We've got scientists talking against this. It's like, no, that, that it's been shown, the science shows that it's, it's uh, you know, soap and water and reusables is really the way to go. So yeah. as you go through that, what I've done is always looked at the, at, at the as someone that, that aims to be zero wasteful. Um, mm -hmm. I, and I always bring my own. I always look at, I, I kind of scope out the area and see what they're doing. The other day I went to a coffee shop and I want to, support my local coffee shops, but I, I'm hating it because they won't let me refill my, my, my cup. And um, they're giving me a, a paper cup and then I have to always catch them and like, don't put the lid on it, you know? And then I just immediately pour it into my cup. But we did a workaround, I, I showed up at my favorite coffee shop and they saw that I had their uh, mm -hmm. sticker on my cup and they thought it looked really cool. And I'm like, yeah, it is cool, too bad I can't use it. And they just ended up making my fancy, uh, Cortado drink, like, okay, I, I think I can do it. Like hold the cup and they, they made it right there for me. Yeah. Um, and I don't think anyone was gonna do that, but also I, I just think you just kind of look around when, when I, when they wouldn't let me bring my bag to the grocery store, like they wouldn't let me bring it in. Um, I said, okay, put it all in the cart, you know, 
you don't get to touch it. I don't want that plastic bag. I took it, took the card out to my car and then I put everything in the bag, in my own bag. But there's, I always look at the workarounds and how we can do that. But also we need to get the facts out there and we need to have these decisions made on science. Right now I'm on an email thread with um, organizers in St. John Virgin Islands and they're pulling their hair out because uh, mm -hmm. the governor there, whatever it's just said, it mandated to open up that they have to use single use reusable, I mean, single use plastics. And they were like, no. And, and so we, I've just bombarded them with all these letters that we wrote to our governor in California and everything and, and the science behind it, which is really important. Um, so yeah, um, I think I answered your question, but that, that's some of the things that we're working on and it's, 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 it's out there and it's really unfortunate that they're trying to to push this agenda of more single use plastic where we really need to go the other way around. Oh, and actually my brother owns a restaurant and he had to, he opened up early cause he's in Florida. But one of the things he said to me, which really stuck, he goes, you know, a lot of these measures, he goes, it's what we're supposed to do anyways. Like this is health code. Um, you're supposed to be wiping down those condiments before each person, you know, I mean, they've always had, health codes and restaurants are are in play to help stop, you know, the spread of viruses and, and disease amongst each other, amongst uh, customers. Some of the things they're doing differently is you can't preset the tables because they don't want the, the silverware or the glassware or the plate to be exposed to anything in the air. So you have to set, you know, the table for each setting. Uh, they're telling you to wrap the, the silverware ahead of time and then put that in a closed container. And then you serve it with each, you know, person, something like that. So there's, like I said, there's a lot of workarounds that make sense that saves money for the business, and it's kind of what they need to do, anyways. It's 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 health codes. I don't really have anything to add because uh, during this lockdown, I have been super busy um, reading books and learning, uh, becoming a carpenter, and I've been making this bed that I'm sitting on outside on my balcony and I have just ignored what is going on in the restaurant business. So I have nothing to add to this. I'm sorry, <laughs> but Jackie said everything perfectly. <laughs> nice. But thank you so much for those answers. And ever since that I have heard the four, but is now five R's from the Plastic Fusion Coalition, I have always refused single use plastic. And what exactly do you see is the future of single-use plastics? Because sometimes what I imagine is that um, is that once single-use plastic production has stopped, people will see single-use plastic as like this monster that plagued the planet and is now this dangerous thing in museums that people say, wow, that must have been terrifying. So what exactly do you think would be the future for single-use plastics in your eyes? Well, of course, you know, the reason why I called the last plastic straw the last plastic straw was that I envisioned that it became obsolete, yeah, that it, you know, I don't know, in your history and in your brief history on Earth, uh, Lily, if you know this, well, maybe from Europe, because you know, in the U.S. we had these smoking sections in restaurants. So I wanted the straws to go by way, like, like the smoking sections in restaurants that we don't even, it's not something that you see in restaurants anymore. Um, but with that said, uh, you know, one of the things I always say about plastic is it never was and never will be disposable. It's just not. And you can't put lipstick on a pig. You can't tell me that plastic is compostable or biodegradable because it, it never will be. You know, you're, you're biodegraded to what? You know, if there's any kind of polymer in it or chemical, well, that's just going to change form and it's always going to be in the thing. So, I, one of the things that I'm really strict about is language, and I'm not going to perpetuate the myth about plastic. I'm never going to say recyclable plastic or disposable plastic or use any of those terms because it doesn't fit any of those definitions. What it is, what plastic is in our environment, is hazardous waste. It fits that definition to a T. If we can get, there's a group of scientists, um, uh, there was a report actually back in 2013, maybe in 2012, Chelsea Rockman doing microplastics. Um, it was five scientists, and at the end of this this study, they said, you know, they they actually advocated for hazardous waste designation for plastic. And if we can if we can treat it what it really is, then there's 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 a lot of checks and balances for that, and and basically industry will be held accountable. They've been doing a good job of kicking the can down the road and saying don't litter and recycle, and that's not the problem. The problem's with the material and how we're using it. I think plastic's going to stay. 
it's it's a it's a wonderful material for a lot of things, but for single use, it's just to me, it's a crime, and there's there's no there's no use for it. It needs to be able to emulate nature. You know, if you're going to do something that lasts, um, that that wants to be thrown away, it needs to be able to become part of nature. So there's a lot of great um, science that's coming out and and um, material science that's coming out where they're using seaweed kelp, uh, different things with that actually would have like maybe a, a two week two week life, shelf life, but actually is edible, right? At end of life. And that's kind of what you want, you know? I don't want to have, what is the nutritional value of something that can last on a shelf for six months or something? You know, it's just like, it, you're not getting whole food. So I think a lot of the answers are going to be regional um, mm -hmm. and is going to be more of like local food, kind of like how we used to live instead of, you know, using all of these fossil fuels and everything to, to ship all this, you know, food this junk food to us, it, it, it's be, it will become more whole food, more nutritional value. It'll be something that everyone will be healthy and the money stays in your communities and you have more of a local economy. And that to me, that's more of a, a circular type economy. And that's yeah. really what it is. You, you can even take that with solar, right? Microgrids. I mean, that's what's going to make it, you, you want to keep it local and attainable. And you see that also in science with how um, or marine science or animals and how they live in these these little, you know, uh, in these little I don't know, I, these little communities and how everything kind of works together. So yeah. I can let Pia take it from there, but that's kind of how I, I I see it. Thank you, Jackie. <laughs> Oh, yeah, you had so many great points, and I completely agree. We need to develop sort of like a dictionary for this sun because there's so many people talking about disposable plastic and compostable plastic. And as you said, plastic is plastic. And then you can have compostable stuff that looks like plastic and acts like it for a certain amount of time, but it's not plastic. And it's such a big, like, bioplastic is a word that I hear all the time in some sentences or settings. That just means that it's been, it's plastic, but it's been made from renewable sources like trees because you can make anything that you all well, I mean anything you can make from oil you can make from a tree you just have to add another few steps but the, the end product is the same so the coke bottles that said it's 40 percent bioplastic it's still plastic it acts exactly the same as the old bottle did but people are stupid including me so we think in our heads that it's okay to just throw it out I, I see so many dog poop bags that are biodegradable that are just yeah. lying around for some reason people think that it's okay to pick up the dog poop put it in this bag and just throw it away again because we're idiots we are moronic species we are not meant to last um but i forgot what i was supposed to say right now because i got okay. myself so irritated about this uh yo I yeah sorry single use plastic jackie said it Plastic is an amazing product. It has been so useful. It has made so many great, I mean, everything that we have around us. I mean, this society would not be possible. This conversation would not be possible without plastic. And there's a lot of good use for single use plastic, like in medicine terms, but for everyday life, like you don't need a straw. I mean, I, I, Norwegians love hiking. We are a hiking and camping type of people. And all of us have these, wooden pl plates and the wooden cutlery, I think it's called, stuff like that. Why would you need anything disposable? We absolutely do not need to go to the store and buy a pack of disposable plastic forks and, you know, knives because we're having a birthday party and we don't want to do the dishes because cake is messy and we just want to throw it. It's so stupid. But as with the, the smoking stuff, when the politician said, so now it's banned. Everybody was just, everything is going to fall to pieces. Society will collapse because smoking was apparently the one thing that kept us together. And then they banned all smoking in these public places. And everybody was like, this is awesome. I can actually smell the food <laughs> and breathe properly. So I'm we brave. just need we adapt to change really fast, but we need to be kind of enforced upon it. So these things that we really don't need to survive, it's gonna be obsolete, I hope, in the future. And one of the job. things yeah, one of the things I like to say about bioplastic, I mean actually scientifically, I mean uh, the word plastic is is a, is a term of plasticity and whatever and it is a definition. But I tell like I have my friend um, Chelsea who uh, started Lollyware, who does the the uh, the kelp straws, the edible straws. Um, 
and she, when they first started, they were calling it edible bioplastic. And I'm like, whoa, whoa, is there any plastic in there? And she goes, well, no. I said, then don't even use the word plastic. I know it's a technical term, but um, you know, I'm not going to be sold on that. I'm not going to eat that. I'm not going to even think that that would even do it. So I really encourage people that are coming out with these, these biomaterials to not even use the word plastic, even if it fits the definition in the plasticity. You want to separate yourself from that. I call also bioplastic, it's like putting, you made the, the analogy of smoking, and I did too, but um, it's like putting a filter on a cigarette. It just exacerbates the problem, right? It's the same. Makes no sense. Makes no sense. <laughs> it harms and acts like plastic in our environment. You know, yeah. it's, it's not a, there's yeah. no place for it. Yeah. And there is a lot of uh, bad marketing done for this. They strap on the like, we are sustainable and we are, um, environmentally friendly oh that's also a term I, environmentally friendly i seen this there was a, a business that i actually really like and they were like we have these environmentally friendly stockings nylon stockings so like what how is this environmentally well it's recycled plastic and i was like okay well that's not environmentally friendly it's just not as bad in the whole big picture but when you throw that one out into the woods it will still be bad for the environment so it's not friendly to the environment so we need to you know get our words correct definitely yeah well thank you so much and i really agree because when people throw away plastic they just think oh it's just gone we don't have to think about it anymore but that's not true because people really need to see the other picture of plastic the more dangerous side of it which also leads me to my next question which is how is the best way to make plastic unappealing or uncool? <clears throat> yeah. Can I, yeah. We, well, we tried that one in Norway. I just have to say, we tried with uh, this. Um, well, no, wait, that's wrong. That wasn't the plastic. That was, uh, we had this thing called snooze where they just put tobacco up in our lips. And they had this massively failed thing because they wanted people to just, you know, stop doing this. So they forced all producers to create their boxes uh, to be identical. And the layout for that has been receiving awards because it's so, it was so good because every, I don't know. So we just failed. But yeah, Jackie, you were supposed to. Yeah. Well, no, I actually have a strong opinion about this i think a lot of things that we can do and again it starts with the individual if we get if we can get influencers to start bringing their own and showing it i mean it it, it trends make it cool um i'm not cool but uh if you know there are other cool people that could do it uh for a while there i had um i created i made like a, a little ribbon out of a out of a plastic straw like like the the aids ribbon or the the um uh what was the other one the breast cancer so I, I chose green, you know, a Starbucks mm -hmm. straw green and put it on. And I was hoping that would trend because that would be my last plastic straw. Somebody asked, is that, and they, oh, thank you for asking. That's my last plastic straw. I might as well wear it. It's my burden to bear. It's going to outlive me in generations to come. Mm -hmm. This is my reminder to ask for no straw. And then if I guess bartender or waitress, you know, oh, that's her last plastic straw. I'm not, I know she doesn't want a straw. Hasn't trend yet, but but those are the kind of things that I think you know the zero uh, the the zero wasteful. Um, I would love to do product placement. Um, you know, intervoice artists. It would be great to have um, a, a writer for a lot of the um, even for us as activists. Every time that we go to a or agree to speak at a panel, whatever, we want to make sure that it's it's going to be single use, plastic free. Uh, to have that be part of a writer for, you know, you don't want, like, if you're if you're an actor, like, you want to try to be as plastic-free as possible in your set. Or if you have a character, to be able to just, I mean, it could be subtle product placement, but your character happens to bring their own reusable cup and walk into the room instead of that, you know, single-use, uh, uh, you know, coffee cup that you see that they picked up at the thing or, or, or show up with the plastic straw and stuff. So things like that, I think, would be awesome. Um, I think it was super funny that uh, Game of Thrones, they found the, the, the one of the last Game of Thrones that they, they saw a plastic water bottle in the, in the scene. And it's just like, yeah, see? But, you know, those kind of things, it's just, I think it would be great to just kind of slowly kind of trend that, that it's, it just becomes a norm. Yeah. I mean, that's why I would say that's almost 
product displacement that you just take out the products that you don't want people to have a normal relationship to and i would say like so one of the things that is great with living in a super small country is that things tend to trend a little bit easier in the whole country so that's actually been there's a lot of we call them green influencers that has now taken it upon them to do to uh what is it called like uh, up talk uh, mending your your clothes and uh, using you know your re reusable cup and stop you know wasting all these things but i also think we have to work on the attitudes of people because plastic itself is not the problem it's hard how we use it or misuse it so we we tend to kind of abuse all of this and it's been actually there was this really interesting um research thing going on here where they talk to a bunch of people and they actually show that our mindset when we're in the cities is completely different from when we're out into in nature. So people in the city tend to litter way more because they know that there's somebody who's going to come and pick it up anyway, as opposed to in the woods where we like to go out and hug trees and talk to moss where, you know, maybe there's a little fox that's going to come and pick it up and eat it. So we have this whole different thing. And they, they tried this in multiple of these tourist traps where there was so much litter and they just took a whole, they closed off one of the most popular um, trails during the summer for two days and they just cleaned every single piece they could find. And after that litter has just dropped by a gazillion percent because you don't want to be that first person to throw something into, into nature. So that's also it's kind of the psychology of this is just really, it's, it's sort of weird, but it makes sense. So we need to just work on people's attitudes as well. And I just have to, I know we're going way above our time limit here, but, and this is sort of off topic, but sort of not as well. Uh, but the last, no, 2018, we had 100,000 people in Norway going out during the beach cleanup oh. week to pick up plastic. 2019, we were 60,000. And the problem hasn't been any smaller, like there's no, not less plastic entering the oceans, but there were less people going out there. So what happened? Well, in 2018, the Norwegian network, like the national network, pumped out, go to pick up plastic. They pumped up plastic and beach cleanups in every single channel they had. There were like 13 different radio channels that were just like plastic, 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 plastic. And they did not do the same thing in 2019. So now we have 40,000 people who lack that inner motivation to keep on doing it. So, so many people need to have this one to actually get get out there. So we need to have that, yeah, we need to think long-term. Uh, and I think, I don't remember which one of you said it, but having that sense of ownership to nature, when you think that this is partially mine and you don't want something that's partially yours to be destroyed. So we need to just make more people love nature. And I think, if you love something, you protect it, that's one thing. But also when you go out and you do a beach cleanup, you spend three hours picking up plastic, you're not going to throw that Snickers paper mm -hmm. on the ground afterwards. Okay. So, yeah. Oh, sorry. No, it's okay. No, it doesn't matter. So this leads me to my last question for today, and that is, what advice do you have for uh, for uh, for someone that wants to become an activist or wants to protect the planet and the ocean? What is your advice? Can, sorry, can you repeat it? I oh, something okay. happened to my ear. My ear. Oh, um, what is your advice? Uh, what is your advice for uh, for someone that wants to protect the ocean and the planet or someone that wants to be uh, an environmentalist? Um, just, can I start? <laughs> this is well, just get learned. I don't know if that's a real expression I learned from the internet, but get learned is just yes. go out there and learn about, you need knowledge about what you're supposed to protect in order to mm -hmm. actually be able to protect it in the right way. Because now we have a lot of people making a lot of really cool quick fixes that in the long run turns out to be really bad for everything else. Like tote bags, great example of something that would just, okay, so I hate these plastic bags. I'm gonna have an organic cotton tote bag that has been made from scratch and it's probably from some happy farmers in a country that I don't know where it is. And you have these tote bags and you go around and you feel good about yourself, but that tote bag has in his or its life cycle 
spewed out carbon emissions and pollution. So we only think about, you know, the end product. We don't really, we don't realize how much um, is behind that end product. So we need to start thinking more, um, oh, I forget the word for this, but like the, the whole, get the whole picture in. And we really need to have more nature in our schools. I don't know what it's like in the rest of the world, but in Norway, there I mean, we have the world's second longest coastline. We have the world's biggest cod population, the world's biggest, I hate this word, cold water coral reef. Um, there's so much ocean. We, we rule over six times as much ocean as land, but there's no marine biology in school, nothing. I was 18 and I swallowed like three liters of water because I saw a blue fish the first time I was diving. Mm -hmm. And the dive master was like, yeah, that's, that's uh, one, one of the most normal or like common fish we have in Norway. And I was like, I had no idea. I've been obsessed with the ocean for my entire life, but I had no clue that that one was there. So yeah, we need to have more education. About, like, we need to know more about this. So that's, that's true. I definitely agree because I really think that uh, that that sh um, that, that sh uh, the um, the environmental the um, the environmental problems should be taught in schools. I think that should that's uh, that that's very important. So so that children can really learn about how to protect the ocean. So thank you all so oh and um, uh, so thank you very much, Pia and Jackie. Do you have anything else to say? Yeah. For this? Yeah, quickly, I, I just want to say if, if you're really like a budding environmentalist and want to get in, involved, mm -hmm. um, really just find out what you're passionate about and okay. really, you know, go for that. Um, you, you really, and it doesn't matter what it is, if it's just mm -hmm. like a, a little snail or plastic pollution or whatever. But one of the things I really want to encourage is that there's been this kind of myth that's been perpetuated of like the hero. And there's no real hero. Then those no one else is going to save. It, but you know, we all are heroes in our own way. And um, there are a lot of marginalized voices that are are being affected every day by this. You know, we've got uh, you know people in these island communities that are not even going to be existing. You know, ten years from now uh, because of global warming and everything. So really find out whatever that you're getting involved in. Find out who's in that space. Uh, really try to elevate those voices. It's not about you coming in and, and talking all the time. It's about really listening um, to these communities. Uh, when I started Last Plastic Straw, one of my main things that I wanted to do was I really felt that no one sets out to the plant. They're just not aware. I wanted to get the information out there, empower, empower people. I don't know if that's the right word, but get the tools so that they can do it in their own community. You know your community better than I do. And if you want to take on this issue, I've done all the work. Here's the tools. Uh, but I'm not going to, I'm not, I don't know. It, it might be the way I did it. It might not be. You might be able to use this, you know, information, but really you need to really listen and, and embrace some of these marginalized communities because there, there are leaders, there are grassroots leaders in, in these communities that are, are seeing it. It is survival. I, I don't like to use warring terms when I speak about the environment or the work that we do. I want it to be inclusive and and it's not going to be like a revolution. It's going to be an evolution of the species. I mean, we cannot continue oh. living this way. And so how do we evolve um, as humankind and work together and, and really kind of elevate these voices, I think, is, is really important. I, I need to add something to that. I'm sorry, but this is so important because I just, yeah, we, we talked about this last week and it's been one of the like biggest issues that we really don't talk about is a lot of the, the expression that there's no environmental justice without social justice. And this whole Black Lives, new Black Lives Matter movement or the new wave of it just goes to show that we are not capable of taking care of our own species. I mean, if not, if we cannot even treat members of our own species properly how on earth are we gonna you know fix these massive problems and there's so many people out there today that are just they wake up and they're concerned about how to find food and just survive and we do not i mean we don't sort of um Mar no wait that's not the correct word well we just have to one thing is have an open mind and everybody everybody will let everybody do what they're capable of doing i mean some of us can go out on big beach cleanups every single day. Um, other ones, maybe like you're a single mom and you have three kids. So the only thing you can actually do is just like sort plastic. In. Like you can recycle plastics and go with the bottles. And that's fine. 
you do what you're capable of doing. Uh, but again, this whole including everybody is so important. We need to be more inclusive and actually treat other people properly because, yeah, I don't know. I, you know, I have a, a, one more thing too, because a lot of these, these communities, these marginalized communities are affected by the pollution in every stage mm -hmm. of its existence of plastic from, you know, the manufacturing to the refineries to, the, you know, the, the, the waste and, and time and again. And I, I just came across this, this great quote um, that I want to share. Uh, because there's a lot of endocrine disrupting chemicals coming and, and there's a huge, they call them cancer alleys and huge rates of asthma. And um, so this is a great quote by Lindsay Dillon. And it's, for many people, the lived experience of police violence and toxic exposure, these different forms of physical vulnerability both live together. We have to think of them together instead of thinking them separately. And that's by Lindsay Dillon. So I just wanted to have that in people's minds that this is all interconnected. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much, all of you. I thought that this panel went so good, and I just don't know how, how to describe how inspiring this went. And I just want to thank you all again so much. And um, this just went amazing. And um, is there anything else that anyone would like to uh, would like to say? But um, is there anything Stay badass. <laughs> Stay awesome. Yeah, yes. you're awesome. You're awesome. Keep it up. <laughs> I can word. jump in at the end and just uh, thank you all so much. Like it's been amazing to listen on to. I've been backstage listening and yeah, I'm just like, uh, yeah, so inspired and motivated and just touched because we really, you know, we touched upon all the issues, you know, women, race, discrimination, plastic, animals, planet, and just kind of showed that, you know, this is all so connected and we can't take care of just one thing and expect, you know, the whole planet to be healthy because it's not going to work that way. So, yeah, I mean, it's, it's really been amazing. And uh, thank you, Pia. And thank you, Jackie. And of course, thank you, Lily. And obviously, I want to thank our uh, all of our partners, uh, which is uh, Eco Shaker, um, also listening in the back, um, and uh, IVA uh, of my, my own company. And I'm so grateful to be able to work for such a company that promotes everyone's rights and works for equality and works super, super hard together. And uh, obviously, Youth Mandas, which we organized last year and is a uh, environmental youth festival and this year unfortunately we couldn't do it because of the virus but next year we'll be back and at the same time we are also going to do uh, world oceans day in italy and uh, i i really really hope we can be there in italy next year so i'm i'm super super grateful and uh, yeah i'm really thank you for sharing your time and education and thank you for being so passionate thank you so much Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for having us and thank you for moderating this, Lily. You are You're welcome. Awesome. <laughs> I want to be like you when I grow up. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. It was really good to see you to see you here. And it was also really awesome to see you too, Jackie. <laughs> Uh, next yeah. time, next time we'll meet in person. Hopefully, yeah. uh, hopefully in uh, yeah in Italy for Voldi next year. And thank you, WODI, who is one of our sponsors, right? Who's put this all on? Is that a Wodi? Wodi, yeah, that's Wody. World Ocean Day Italy. So that's Wodi. Thank you. Yes, thank you for that. <laughs> uh, for organizing this, this is amazing. <laughs> thank you. Have a have a great day, and right. thank you so much, ladies. Bye. Bye. Yeah, bye.